And uh, next, next on our speakers uh, list is uh, Bearded Douglas. And uh, this is uh, very interesting, uh, especially for me personally, because uh, Bear is uh, Director of Developer Relations at Slack. And uh, she's going to discuss uh, how Slack uh, builds uh, their APIs uh, and uh, also demonstrate uh, uh, how the workflows are also built along with the APIs. And um, let me share the stage to uh, Shara. Let's welcome, uh, sorry, let's welcome Bear. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank um, you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. You hear me okay at everything? That's great. Okay, great. Then let's yes. get this shared now. Great. Now you're seeing uh, my let, screen. Yeah. Can you uh, extend that screen? Can you make it full screen? Can you? Let's see. How's that? Okay. okay. Looks good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All the best. Uh, and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, Let's great. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. So hi, everyone. Oh, it doesn't look like my slides are advancing in this view. Yikes, I might need to unfortunately not have this window all the way. Let's see. I'm gonna try one more time, see if that helps. Yeah, I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm gonna have to uh, not have this window fully maximized in order to be able to see some of my notes. Let me do that. I'm gonna pause here for a second. All right, thanks so much for bearing with me. I'm sorry that they weren't slides weren't advancing when I was clicking. Um, so hi, my name is Bear and I lead the developer relations team over at Slack. My pronouns are she and her. And I've been at Slack for about three and a half years. Um, in that time I have seen the product and the platform change quite a bit. So I wanted to start off by setting some context for those of you who maybe haven't worked with Slack in the past or, or don't know about its history. Um, so the history of Slack has, has shaped how we have designed Slack to be even more extensible by more people. Slack wasn't originally set up as a company to build Slack. It was originally a company called Tiny Spec, and it created a game called Glitch, which you see on the screen here. Uh, and Glitch didn't work out as a product, but if any of you have ever hit a 404 page for Slack, some of these trees in the animation style that you see on the left might look familiar. That's where Glitch lives on. Um, but so the Tiny Spec team was split among offices that were in San Francisco, New York, and Vancouver. And like many companies that were so globally distributed, they needed a way to stay in contact. And so to do that, they used IRC. And IRC works. You can chat with people in your team. You can divide content to topic channels and so on. But IRC has some major limitations, like you don't get a searchable archive, you can't integrate other tools, and it's not particularly friendly to people who aren't engineers. So the team had built some bots to try and work around limitations in IRC. And as TinySpec was winding down and everyone was looking for what was next, they realized that they wanted to work in a place that would have access to those IRC bots. So they thought a little bit about how they could make it work for other companies. And that is what eventually evolved into the Slack that we know and love today. So we focus on features that enable better collaboration, uh, richer UI, and there's native support for multiple platforms among a bunch of other features. But there's a lot of IRCs still in Slack. You have users, channels, messages, and one feature in particular that calls back to the IRC days, and that is slash commands. So in IRC, all of the platform native commands were issued with strings that started with slash. And so we brought that over to Slack, but we also made it so that integrations that were not native to Slack could use this and introduce their own slash commands. And they're really widely used. Most integrations with Slack use slash commands to kick off their workflows. And while they're intuitive to engineers or people who used IRC in the past, not everybody is familiar with why you would start off with a slash and then enter in some text to, to introduce a command. So there's slash commands and there are also the concept of chatbots. IRC had bot users that would listen in channels and respond to commands. And so a lot of early users in Slack embraced these. They brought their bots over from IRC and other services like Campfire or HipChat. 
Um, and early commercial apps on Slack, like Poncho, the weather bot, which is in this in this screenshot here, uh, became successful by developing personalities that they had on Slack. And so all these people who had been used to using slash commands and chatbots and IRC and other chat platforms had this really easy time adapting to Slack and being able to do more in Slack with these extra bits that they could add in through integrations. And so we were delighted by that. And we care a lot about having our early tech focused users being well served. But Slack now is used by different companies across lots of different types of industries, law firms, hospitals, restaurants, universities. All of these industries are using Slack and we wanted a way for everyone to be able to access the power of apps, the things that had made developers lives so much easier using Slack. And if you fast forward to today, that vision is coming true. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly three quick stories about companies who have built internal apps that change the way they work. So Vodafone is one of the world's largest multinational telecom companies. And they serve over 500 million customers and their DevOps team relies on Slack to maintain uptime. So they have apps by PagerDuty and Datadog and custom built apps that they created themselves to monitor and escalate incidents within Slack within milliseconds of an incident happening. Um, and they've built custom apps that integrate with AWS and other services. So engineers can spin up environments to production in just 30 seconds. So they've been able to reduce mean time to resolution on incidents from to 20 minutes to down to just five, which is a pretty incredible result. But it's not just DevOps teams that benefit from using Slack and using that, that chat ops ethos of bringing people and information together in the system to get work done faster. Uh, Hearst Magazines, which has a portfolio of 25 brands like, like L Magazine, um, with more than 2,500 pieces of content created across them every single day, they needed a way to get that data into the hands of employees like editors and executives and SEO managers so they could do more with it. So they built an app called Hansbot, which is short for Hearst Answers Bot. And it responds to questions in natural language, like what were the top performing stories on L yesterday? So it's possible for non-technical employees to ask Hans what's trending or what brands have previously published about topics that are trending and how those pieces performed. So all of that adds up to a lot of time save for an editor or an SEO manager who's trying to get their head around this data. And user show, data shows that Hans saves employees an average of an hour a day. And it also, uh, getting access to those analytics led to big gains across the division. Their e-commerce revenue nearly tripled since using Hans because everybody had access to that data at their fingertips. So that was a, a big scale project that was paying large scale dividends for Hearst. But there are little things that people are doing all the time without development time that can really change how teams operate. Uh, DocuSign revamped their new hire onboarding by creating a workflow in Slack, which we'll talk about in a second, where every time a new employee joined, it would show that new hire a list of locations where they could find documentation about their team and their active projects so they could get up to speed. And it takes care of introducing people to their new team by telling things like, what's a fun fact about you? And then post that answer to the team channel. And something like this only takes a couple of minutes to set up. So this is super exciting for us because this vision that we had several years ago that chat ops like developers were doing it should be accessible for everyone in every industry is starting to come true. We're starting to see customers build and use these apps to approve expenses and ship software to publish breaking news, manage retail stores and so on and so on. But it took a while to get there and to evolve our platform so we could actually meet developer and end user needs as they evolved. So in order to make it possible for people to get that more from Slack, we had a series of principles. One of the things that we had to do is that we had to make things that feel like they should be easy, actually easy. So let's unpack that because it's, it's kind of a complex statement. What feels like it should be easy in Slack? Uh, the first obvious thing is sending notifications. Slack is a communications tool. So when something happens that your team needs to know about and talk about, you should probably send it to Slack and that should be easy. Uh, the next thing is rich data display. The basics like posting an image or a link to Slack should be super straightforward because we want catching up in Slack to feel interactive, not like you're reading a book. And by that line of thinking, you also need basic interactivity. So if you want to attach a confirm or deny button to a notification, that should be simple via our API. So starting with the middle one, this bit about rich data display, Slack clients do the right thing 
by default when someone posts a link, meaning if it's a publicly accessible URL, we'll go grab the metadata in that URL for Open Graph or for Twitter cards or whatever markup you have, and then inflate that back in Slack. And that's easy and it doesn't require any work. If the link does require some sort of auth to view the content, you can register an app with Slack to receive a notification when links from your domain are shared. Pardon the ambulance. So uh, when that happens, you can give the user an option to log in and then pass the right unfurl into Slack. So it's a little more work, but it's very possible for all kinds of end users to see that value of, of apps and integrations. So that's, that's basic uh, data display. Talking about notifications for a second, they are one of the most basic elements of working in Slack. You receive notifications from other systems. And so one of the decisions that we made early on was that we should create some apps that we put in our app directory that would take care of all of the boilerplate, what would be code around setting up services to consume content from sources like an RSS feed and then route it to a Slack channel. So we decided a non-technical end user should be able to install something like this RSS app to their workspace and then just feed it the URL, map it to a channel, and then be done. But many services don't publish that way. A lot of modern software tools use webhooks to publish events to other services. So we wanted to make that super simple too. In the Slack app dashboard, you can create an app and set up webhook URLs for particular channels. And because that last part of easy things easy is basic interactivity like buttons, you can also pass in what we call message attachments, which are JSON describing UI that you want to display in Slack as part of the webhook payload. And we decided to take it one step further. We created a GUI tool called the Block Kit Builder, which you see here in the screenshot, to help you build the UI that you might want to attach into your webhook payload. So in the Block Kit Builder, you've got UI elements on the left-hand side that you can click to add to your canvas that's in the middle, and then you can edit the JSON on the right-hand side to see it update live in the preview. And you can even use that green Send to Slack button to send the message to a Slack channel to preview it live and try it out before even setting up your webhook. So we doubled down on easy again, and then we also provided templates for really common UI patterns that we saw in Slack, because we don't expect that everyone is familiar with the UI elements that we offer inside messages and areas in Slack. So the more help we could give people to design and create well-designed apps, the better of an experience everyone's going to have. So when you click that button that says use message template, it will pre-populate that graphical tool, the block kit builder from the previous slide with the JSON you need to create this message. And so then if you want to share designs with friends, we, we created the block kit builder so you could copy and paste the URL for your design and your current view is always reflected in that URL. So now setting up a webhook that sends a notification into Slack with some amount of buttons and other interactivity is as simple as two or three rounds of copy pasting. So there's a post request that you copy paste from the app management dashboard. And then in the pink, the second copy paste is from Block Kit Builder. So our choices here about what tooling to build and what was worth investing time into, what making super simple, was informed by what we saw people already doing in Slack. So we knew that they wanted to consume notifications from other services. And then ideally, when you got a notification from that service, there should be a next step. I got this notification, so now what? So we put a lot of time and engineering effort into building the tooling support that makes setting that up super, super easy. But there's a hitch. <laughs> we made it really easy for engineers. The thing about webhooks is that even though they're pretty straightforward conceptually, the fact that they involve code at all is intimidating to a lot of people who aren't engineers or who don't work in tech. So as I said before, one of our missions with the platform is to make this transformative power of apps that's been available to engineers and to DevOps teams for some time, going on a decade now, that should be available to everyone. So it's important to us to make everything that we want to be able to feel accessible to everyone. So in 2018, we acquired a company called Missions and they made a product inside Slack that allowed you to automate tasks that involve some custom logic without writing code. That product today is now incorporated into Slack in the tool we call Workflow Builder. You can think of it as kind of like, if this, then that for Slack. And it was an important acquisition for us because it does a really good job of boiling down a workflow to its conceptual flow and stripping away the code so people can understand what they're setting up in a way that feels straightforward. 
Um, and so we introduce concepts like how you trigger a workflow. And once a workflow has been triggered, users can add custom logic through a clickable GUI about what happens next, like send a message or open a form to capture more information. And so we've seen a lot, a lot of end customers use this. DocuSign use this for onboarding new employees like we talked about earlier. And other companies use it for things like running daily standups or um, collecting information about customer phone calls. And some of these are engineering use cases, but many of them aren't. So just like with the Blockit Builder, we wanted to help users who weren't as familiar with Slack the product still be successful from the get-go. And we did that by providing templates. So people could pick a template, customize it in their own Slack workspace. And templates were things like for remote work use cases, reminders to get up and drink water and so on. Um, and an interesting note is that we actually had templates for this from the start. And those templates were published in our help center as downloadable files that had a .json extension. And that really confused people. Bringing the template library into the client directly like you see here in this slide, and then removing the need to download it and re-upload it has helped people get over that hurdle much more easily. And we know that there are people who will get used to using Workflow Builder and then be able to trigger a workflow from an event in another service, maybe by a webhook. So in that situation, we don't want to bounce them out to our developer site. It doesn't feel right. If you're building something in Slack in Workflow Builder and then you pop somebody out to the developer site, that's a jarring user experience. So what we wanted to do was make all of this webhook setup fit entirely within the client experience with Workflow Builder. So we put a lot of thought into thinking about how Workflow Builder could be as easy to use as possible. And that's a lot to consider. So one of the first things that we thought about was how many features to go to market with in the first release. So Workflow Builder right now, for example, doesn't have branching logic and there are fewer than 10 possible triggers to start a workflow. And we made that choice intentionally because we wanted the first release to feel super simple and super straightforward. Simple is not so straightforward. <laughs> there are a lot of things to explore about what makes something feel easy or hard to use. So one of the things that we learned early on with Workflow Builder was that uh, figuring out how to make it intuitive where workflows appeared and for whom and what context was really hard. Because suppose you have a company of 100,000 people and they're all using Slack and 5% of those people build a workflow for themselves, that's 5,000 workflows floating around that might all be called my to-do. And how do you know that you found your version of my to-do if they're all called my to-do? So what we, made, what we decided is that workflows should be tied to channels so that people know where to find them and it would keep things a little bit neater. And then we also had a lot of things to work through with admins, like making sure that they had control and oversight over who in their organization could build something like this in the first place that everything the workflow builder touched was compliant with security features like enterprise key management and so on. Um, but the amazing payoff that came from it is that now that we've made it so easy to use, millions of custom workflows are getting used every single month. So that's one side of it. We wanted to make the easy things super, super easy. But on the other side is that if easy things should be easy, <coughs> pardon me, ambitious things should be possible in Slack. So what do I mean by ambitious? It's kind of a big word. This is an app that the LA Times built in around 2016. And it's a tool that helps them publish stories directly from Slack, integrating tightly with their CMS and with an editorial workflow channel so that editors can get a feed of new stories coming in. And then they decide where on latimes.com it should be published. And then they can publish them with a single click. You can see those buttons map to areas on LA Times where they should be published. And that was wild. It was totally transformative for their editorial team to be able to just chat with the team about stories coming across their desks. And then without leaving Slack, without requiring a code push, without mucking around in WordPress, they could just click publish and send that story to latimes.com. So that was huge for them. That's what I'd call an ambitious app, one that has real transformational power to change the way a team works. And this one was possible to build with the basics that already existed in our API in 2017. You needed a way to post messages to channels. You needed basic button clicks, interactivity, which in turn required an event-based API to deliver click events. And we needed message thread APIs and emoji reactions, which is great, check, check, and check. But there are other ambitious apps that were bumping up a lot of constraints in our API. So here's an example. Um, this was the SurveyMonkey app in 2017. 
And at the time, it was one of our top examples of great user experience in Slack. So what this GIF is showing you is the experience of picking a survey and then moving on to a task related to that survey, like inviting collaborators or sharing results or collecting responses. And all this had to happen within the context of a message in a channel. We provided a system called attachments, which you can see everything with the colored bar there is an attachment. And you could remove those and replace them when necessary. So you have this whole user flow packed out in this tiny screen context of one message in a channel. And it kept on getting updated and updated. And so it's kind of hard to follow because there are a few things wrong with this. Well, one, if you're trying to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a user, but a message appears in a channel which has multiple users, it's kind of a strange thing. Also, channels move. So this message will be moving in space as people are trying to interact with it. There are other apps like this early version of the Salesforce app, which got around that constraint of having uh, single player and multiplayer by using a concept in Slack called ephemeral messages, which are messages that just show to the current user. So what you're looking at here is a conversation between two people about an account. And one person uses the Salesforce slash command to look up account information for that company. There are a few possible results. The app confirms in that ephemeral message that shows just to them what the person meant, and then they can choose to post the data that they need back to channel. So all of this is still really confusing. And it also trained people to get worried about what would happen if they called a slash command because they didn't know what would post a channel, what would post to them, it was unpredictable. So these types of app were always pushing our boundaries with the things that they needed from us. They needed, they hacked together UI elements that we didn't have, or if we didn't have something like uh, a, an elegant way to pick a date, they would just do it using natural language processing. They were, it was easier for someone to type, you know, remind me to do this on December 15th at 8 a.m. than it was to try and put that together with, with buttons. Um, and they edited and updated these messages constantly, which was thrashing channels full of people. So when we we're thinking about how we could serve this group of developers better with our API, um, we rethought the platform around a few key elements to make it more possible to build ambitious apps. And we call this Slack App Toolkit. I'm not gonna dig into it in too much detail today, except to talk to you a little bit about the new surface areas that we enabled. So before what well, we had, um, the system of attachments, it had a very limited set of building blocks. So an app like Guru wants to show you this information dense message. And so they tried to use like text formatting and emojis to make it more readable, but this is really not readable. So one of the things that we tried to fix with, with Blockit, our new system, was making it much easier to read and also into easier to interact with. You can just click here to create a new card. So we worked with a pretty big pool of beta developers to, to try more elements that people had asked for, like date pickers, and things that they didn't ask for could probably use like dividers. And they were designed to be design, uh, stackable and composable into views like modals. Modals are popover windows that bring you out of the context of conversation to do more involved actions like search for information. And this is handy because unlike a message in a channel, modals stay where they are and they don't move related and they are single player. So we can, we enable these new use cases. The other thing was that people are sometimes simply asking for more space to play with. Taking over an entire window of chat with a message from an app was something that could get you uninstalled because it was annoying. So we decided to create more space in what we call the home tab. So I'm not gonna show you the, uh, the full updates on some of these things because I know we're very close on time, but basically what we needed to build to enable this was a few things. Um, Blockit was an effort that took over a year and involved a lot of coordination across front end clients to work seamlessly from day one. So for example, we had to make sure that Blockit support was shipped several mobile releases ahead of the developer release so that if developers and customers were seeing block enabled messages on their phones, they would actually see what it was supposed to look like. Um, we also had to add new events in our API. And then we also had to put a lot of work into developer education around the changes that we made. But the whole thing about how Slack's API has evolved has really been in response to the ways that we see customers and developers pushing our platform. So if you are using our API, we are paying attention to what you're doing and we would love to hear from you about how we can make the whole experience better. I'm gonna stop there. I know we are right up against time. So thank you so much everyone for bearing with me through ambulances and a couple of tech issues. Um, I think we're right about time.
Uh, thank you so much, Abhay. That was very interesting. Uh, I had personally used uh, Slack, and that was uh, uh, we had internal communication that we can only use Slack and email only for the customer uh, external customers. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Sunil is asking uh, which ID uh, is used for Slack APIs. Um, so. ID. Yes, so uh, we we don't have a preference on what ID you use. Um, we do provide SDKs for our API for uh, Node.js, for Python, and for Java that are that are first party built by Slack. Uh, but there are SDK support for multiple languages. And then what you actually want to use to write in, I, I guess if you if you're a Python developer, you can use PyCharm. If you want to use VS Code, use VS Code. But we we don't mind. That's good. A lot of folks on our team use VS Code or Atom. Yeah, that's good. So lots of flexibilities for the developers. Yeah. And um, there's another question from Anirudha who says that uh, is there an option to uh, as a trial option uh, where you provide uh, Slack for a couple of I mean uh, for some days for developers to test out uh, the all the capabilities that you have. Yes. So Slack is a is a freemium product. So you can try Slack with your team for for free. Um, okay. One thing. When you're when you're trying Slack's APIs, we actually suggest that you create a free workspace to use as your sandbox. Oh, okay, interesting. So so you used a sandbox environment uh, within the team. No, sorry. We suggest that you create a free workspace inside Slack to okay. use as your sandbox. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. so, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for for uh, being on the stage. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Bye bye.